there was a comparison between uh, kind of sedentary people and marathon runners uh, and people who kind of ran just leisurely. And marathon runners actually had more calcified arteries than sedentary people. Uh, and, and I think that's probably tying into energy production, adequate calcium intake. Um, also, you know, you know, arteries tend to calcify uh, when there's dysregulation between calcium and, and you know, activation of parathyroid hormone. Uh, and also from an energy perspective as well. If you're not producing energy efficiently, this is this is perhaps one of the reasons. You know, I mean, hypothyroidism is one of the primary reasons why um, arteries become less flexible, uh, and you get this calcification infiltration that you can see on a, a CAC or a coronary artery calcium score. So, yes, to answer your question, uh, you know, it, different types of exercise can have that effect. I haven't seen, I haven't looked at any papers in kind of different types of sports, but I, I know marathon runners do experience in that for sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Sanders, and welcome back to the Peak Human Podcast. Don't forget to start back at episode one. This is that kind of podcast. It's not something I do each week with random people to create content so I can advertise people's products. It's a health journey I've been on for years and where I talk to the best and brightest from around the world. The only products or services I talk about to support the show are my own that I have created with the best people I can find to provide great value to you and your friends and family, as well as my own. Those are at nosetotail.org. But on to my guest today. This may be a hard one for some people to handle who are triggered easily by differing opinions. I talk with Keith today about adding carbs back into your diet. Many people have found so much success removing them from their diet, this may sound counterintuitive. However, some people may be having problems after going too low carb for too long. If you're not one of these people, then feel free to skip this episode. But if you have cold hands or feet, low body temperature, which I had and didn't really know, wake up in the night, are a female who has lost their period, don't sleep well, or have some of these other problems we mentioned, you may have low thyroid. One way people have cleared up some of these issues is eating more whole food carbs, honey, fruit, sweet potatoes, etc. He's in a different dietary camp that does agree that PUFAs and seed oils are the enemy. Saturated fat is fine, and eating nose to tail, including things like liver and oysters, are great. But they also believe carbs are good for the thyroid and do question fasting and extended keto diets. So really don't want to be dogmatic about diet, so I wanted to have Keith on to talk about this strategy. I've seen it work for some people in the carnivore world that went a bit overboard, for example. I've been raising my body temperature and presumably my thyroid function by eating more carbs at night after my brief intense workouts. So Keith Littlewood has been involved in the health, fitness, and well-being industry for over 20 years and has been working for a variety of organizations delivering training and rehabilitation strategies around the world. He is passionate about delivering services that resolve pain, energy, digestion, sleep, mood, and other hormone-related issues to get people functioning at their best. He has a master's of science degree in endocrinology with distinction, researching the accuracy of thyroid-stimulating hormone in the face of mounting pollution, stress, and nutrition factors, and is currently getting his PhD. He talks about this pro-metabolic idea, which does sound good. You want to have a high metabolism. So let me know what you think after you listen to this entire episode. It's always good to learn new things and not be stuck in your dietary philosophy. So a little bit more about nosetail.org. You can go there and get our grass-fed, grass-finished meats delivered to your door. We have Primal Ground Beef, which is our number one selling product. We have a light version. These have liver, heart, kidney, and spleen mixed in. It's the best way to get your organs. It tastes great. It's simple. You don't have to chop up a bunch of liver, and you can just make a delicious hamburger patty or stir fry with it or whatever you want. So nosetail.org. We have the low omega-6 chicken and pork there as well. You can make your own box. We have free shipping options. You can also add on our great stuff like the biltong and drovors, which is the South African sugar-free, additive-free meat snacks. If you want to eat some good meat on the go, we got the seasonings, which I seriously use every single meal. I feel like I'm a bit addicted to the ranch seasoning in sour cream or yogurt. It's so good. You can put it on anything. Any of the seasonings on the meat is always good. The body care products are sold out so i won't mention those but they're going to come back soon we do have some in stock <laughs> i guess i just mentioned it 
And there's also the Sapien program for those ready to make a big change in their life and want all the materials. We have a 10 week course, we have health coaching. We also have the tribe. We have a few lifetime memberships left. It's been really fun to meet with the tribe. We have Zoom calls where we get to talk and learn from each other with myself or Dr. Gary. You get the extended show notes for this podcast. You get the private members area and some other cool stuff. So sapien.org for all of that. You'll find Food Lies filmed there. You can get on the newsletter there at sapien.org. Got some great stuff coming out every two weeks. No spam, just interesting content from around the web, original content we've made, and other good information. So sapien.org and nosetotail.org for the meat. And that's about it. Please enjoy this one with Keith. Hello. Hello, Keith Littlewood. How are you doing today? Not too bad yourself. I am great. I'm great. I'm in Austin. You're in Dubai. How's it I going? I am currently, um, there are kind of uh, positions to move on from here very shortly, um, but depending on, on re- how restrictions go, that will uh, dictate where we end up in the summer. But um, it's it's getting hot, pushing over 40 degrees during the day at the moment, so uh, getting into that kind of Dubai summer heat. Wow. What What is the, the I think we're going to talk about temperature, so we need to know the conversion from Celsius. Um, I can never remember what it is, but I know all I, I, know, I remember that 98.6 is about 37 degrees. Uh, so 98.6 Fahrenheit to um, uh, Celsius, 37 degrees centigrade. Uh, mm-hmm. I can never, I actually don't know what the conversion well, is. So 40, <laughs> yeah, just a little more than that. So you're over 100. But yes, we need to know that 37. So yes, see, we want to talk about body temperature today. That'll come up. But uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff, including thyroid function. How do you describe your view of health? I, I feel like everyone has a different focus and yours seems to be like a thyroid centric view of metabolism. Well, yeah, I, I got into uh, studying thyroid uh, primarily because I'd, I'd, I'd studied functional medicine. I'd studied nutrition at university. I'd done various nutrition type courses um, uh, that gave me a kind of different view on it. And I, I actually got into to studying thyroid by uh, uh, Ray Pete's work, who kind of, you know, kind of got me thinking about the thyroid as perhaps a, a master regulator of function, uh, and that's kind of what I've been looking at. For I mean, I started reading his stuff and looking at some of his references around around other hormones, you know, progesterone, uh, you know, pregnenolone, and other sci- what other scientists doing. Obviously, Hans Selye's work on stress physiology, um, and it, it kind of got me interested in in hormones generally, and so. That's why I, I went back to uni and started studying endocrinology. And so I, I think to a degree, if you can understand thyroid physiology and the nuances behind it, you can understand various aspects of function. In fact, every single level of aspect of function, whether it's digestive system, neurology, neural function, uh, you know, energetics, blood glucose regulation, cholesterol values, how blood pressure kind of responds uh, and ultimately, how the environment influences thyroid, and that's what my kind of focus is at the moment: is looking at how various pollutants af- affect thyroid physiology and, and why that muddies the waters about how to actually ac- accurately assess it. And I, I think in medicine, because there's this still con- concrete belief that uh, measuring a, a thyroid hormone from the pituitary, the TSH, is a is a gold standard marker for for assessing that. I think that leads to the over prescription of single action medications like, you know, metformin for blood glucose or statins for cholesterol. So it is thyroid centric. There, there, there is, you know, various kind of ins and outs of other aspects of biology that I tend to kind of focus on. But I think, and this is my bias, that that when you understand thyroid physiology, you understand steroid physiology, you understand, um, you know, all of the other aspects of function in the body that tend to to express their symptoms when people aren't having optimal health. Wow, yeah, that's important stuff. And I, you kind of described your background while you you know, just were talking, but just a little more uh, on you, you're getting a, a PhD currently? Yeah, I've just uh, enrolled a PhD at University of Reading. Uh, I'm currently working through a literature review, one of a couple, uh, where I'm actually looking at um, you know, again, this is what I'm looking at is the, the effects of certain environmental pollutants and how they affect thyroid physiology. So 
I'm doing the first three years remotely, then the last three are in the lab, actually looking at um, experiments in in, uh, in rodents' brains and looking at uh, how how the receptors are expressed um, amongst other blood values. But yeah, I got I got into it. Um, I was a, a PT for a number of years. Um, I fell into a job in the fitness industry back in 1995, uh, and I kind of led me into other things. I, I mainly worked as a uh, rehab and kind of pain practitioner for many years, working with basically rehabilitation and corrective exercise. Um, I kind of left personal training uh, back a, a, over 10 years ago uh, and started focusing more on, on that, and uh, that kind of morphed into kind of pain um, sciences and, and 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 looking at things like that and I, I kind of i always knew there was something that was pulling me back to, to kind of biology and and hormones and i think it was really ray pete's where they kind of got me thinking about that and i kind of left the, the functional medicine model the kind of holistic nutrition model and you know about four or five years ago I, I embarked on a master's degree in endocrinology and that's that's where it's got me today but mostly reading lots of books on the subject more than anything else i think it's great to kind of say they have these qualifications but they don't really mean much uh, to many people, but I think uh, reading the books behind it is what what's got me to where I am today, and uh, probably the mm -hmm. hundreds, maybe thousands of papers. Well, well, that's great. Yeah, and I know you had a functional medicine background. You you kind of have some criticisms, which I might share. I mean, I'm into all different things, really. You know, I'm trying to. That's kind of my thing. Is I'll look at all sides and then see what works. And functional medicine certainly has some great things going on. But what are your criticisms of it? Well, I, I think that there can be some, I, you know, don't get me wrong. I don't think it's, it's, it's totally bad, but the, the, the way that the model works, it, it's, it's there for people who have plenty of money or really good insurance uh, policies. Uh, and a lot of insurance policies don't really cover some of the functional medicine stuff. But I think there's a, there can be a definite approach of overanalysis. And you go through one test, then another test, and you keep going back to the same practitioner. They recommend another bucket of supplements. And this can run towards tens of thousands of dollars over a few years. And I, I, and I think whilst it's good, and don't get me wrong, I learned a lot of things by looking at, I remember looking at my first gut test in 2007, looking at myself, uh, and then you know ran hundreds and hundreds of stool tests every year. And it was great to work on digestive systems and get rid of parasites and bacteria. But again, and don't get me wrong, that's probably my, my shortcoming. But looking at that and when you weren't looking at other aspects of function, like, so for example, if you go and do a GI effects or a stool test, you're always going to find something that's out of whack. But again, if you're kind of not understanding how someone's thyroid physiology is working, you're going to find accumulations of bacteria, endotoxins, and you can prescribe all these wonderful fancy gut supplements, you know, till, till your client's rattling down the street. But I think it's just... I think it's, it can promote reductionism in, in, in the complex systems themselves. And, you know, we need to break down the, 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 them into the pieces of the pie so we can understand it. But then putting them back together sometimes doesn't make much sense. And I just feel that functional medicine is going down the way of, of kind of allopathic medicine. Uh, and it's a big moneymaker for some people. And I think that I'm not saying this is everyone, but mm -hmm. people uh, can get drawn into those kind of lab kickbacks and supplement kickbacks without, without really tr truly getting to some of the, the real, you know, crux of what somebody needs. Don't get me wrong with that. That's not a, that's not a criticism of every single practitioner out there. I just think, mm -hmm. I think there are, there are, there are holes that, that are making it problematic and are realistic for people to even kind of attend, you know, functional medicine practitioners and, and clinics. So, you know, I, I, I like to kind of, the way that I work with clients is, you know, I, I like to coach people so they kind of understand what's going on. They go away and experiment with stuff. Supplements are kept to a minimum initially. See what you can do with food first of all. And, you know, I think a lot of the things around functional medicine are always putting on someone like a, an autoimmune paleo protocol, which I think kind of misses the point of what's going on from an autoimmune perspective. And you can get, yeah, if you've got someone who's on a pretty crappy diet and you start getting them to eat uh, loads of fruit and veg, minimize kind of the, the you know, the fillers and the, um, uh, the processed food. Added, added, stuff, exactly. Yeah. You know, you're going to create some change in that. But I've seen so many people that don't do well on that long term. And I, I think that, you know, that there are just these kind of protocols that people put on, you know, like the gut protocol. Was it the 4R gut protocol or something like that? Uh, and I, I just think that, that they kind of lack the, 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 what, what somebody really needs to, to understand what's making them sick in the first place.
Well, it's the root cause. I think that's what you're getting at. It's it's functional medicine is supposed to be about the root cause, but maybe some practitioners are missing that. And that I think you're getting down to a lot of the root cause stuff. And yeah, I mean, we'll get into that today, right? It's like what, like even the thyroid stuff. I feel like we have some of this these things wrong when we do thyroid tests. And maybe you can explain. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I was introduced to that kind of the thyroid uh, concept of, of Broder Barnes and whether it was Ray P or Mark Starr or some other kind of people that have talked about thyroid classically. And this is going back to the 40s and 50s when the way that people were diagnosing thyroid issues was to do basal metabolic rate testing, uh, cholesterol values, Achilles tendon or Walkman sign, you know, the Achilles tendon reflex test. And basically there were, there were uh, Broder Barnes's book, How to Kind of... Um, heart disease, the, the, the missing link. is like he, he found that basically people didn't die of heart disease when he got people on enough thyroid hormone. Uh, and, you know, what happened is is back in the 70s, and this is, I think this can be found on Mary Showman's website, an interview with a doctor called Dr. David Derry, who, who was a very well-respected physician and a clinical researcher, who was actually struck off by the Canadian Medical uh, Board for basically treating people's symptoms uh, that were relating to thyroid. And his argument was, if I'm waiting for the TSH to catch up, it can take a really, really long time, but the symptoms are already there. And they're classic hypothyroid symptoms. And he had another clinician in, in the UK, a guy called uh, Dr. Barry durant Peakfield, who suffered the same kind of fate with the British Medical Council, that, although he, he resigned in the end. Uh, but, but the idea behind it was that you know, these thyroid symptoms or the clinical presentation that people are showing up with are generally glossed over. Uh, and I live in a place where the kind of tests, uh, and I work with a lot of clients globally, where these kind of tests are, are still considered the gold standard. Like, so example, that, that you know, you're aware of the, all the thyroid tests that, that people usually get tested for, but still the supposed gold standard is a TSH with a, a free T4 or a total T4 test. Now, I, I think, and the deeper I've gone with looking at thyroid physiology and pollutants, you know, even if you look at some of the, the, the classic older, you know, last century presentations of low thyroid, it wasn't just people who were overweight. In fact, some of the older researchers suggested it was actually people who were more anorexic tended to have low thyroid function. Uh, and they, you know, they, their physiology got so suppressed. And when you kind of uh, restrict calories to a substantial amount. You start producing massive amounts of growth hormone and uh, cortisol, adrenaline, uh, and the glucocorticoids generally suppress the, the production of pituitary TSH, as an example, that thyroid stimulating hormone when the thyroid's not producing, or should I say, converting thyroid hormones peripherally. So to still be driven by that kind of I, th I think it's I think it's wrong to just diagnose someone based upon a blood test when we know now and some of the things papers I've been looking at recently is that some some pollutants actually bind to the th thyroid hormone receptor. So if you could think about driving around a car park as an example, trying to find a parking space, you can wonder why negative feedback loops kind of can be problematic because you know receptors are bound, there's nowhere to go, and therefore you know circulating thyroid hormones could actually just be just circulating because perhaps they're being, you know, blocked by certain pollutants. So this is where I think some of the problems are with diagnosing someone and the clinical presentation, signs, symptoms, you know, your classic thyroid things, which could be, you know, cold body, altered digestive system, hair falling, insomnia related issues, uh, other hormone related issues, whether it's libido, menstrual cycle, testosterone levels, or, or even fertility and all of the other classic symptoms that go with that. And that's why I think personally looking at temperature, basal temperature and uh, pulse rate can give a, a really good indicator of where someone's at. Now, of course, there can be nuances to that and we can we can discuss those, but it's crude, but it can be effective. And when you sit down and listen to someone and listen to their symptoms and their history, you can start to get a pretty good idea of what's going on without going down these complex testing, which is going to cost lots of people money. And if you certainly look at these these standard blood values of TSH and total T4 or free T4, whatever your choice is, I think it can be problematic uh, and lead to perhaps overdiagnosis. And, you know, I, I think that some of the philosophical constructs around overdiagnosis and overtreatment, which you can find from, you know, philosophers like Ivan Illich or in from, you know, uh, medical anthropologists like Joseph Dummett in his books, Drugs for Life. These are where all the problems are that are associated with it. Uh, 
uh, ultimately over treatment and uh, or over diagnosis and over treatment. That's interesting. I like the like I had um, Doctor. Oh, who was it? Sean O'Mara. Yeah, he he was talking about really simple. Like you can just look at your visceral fat. You can just look at someone and and diagnose them with more accuracy sometimes than you know tons of tests. So I I like the simple thing with the temperature and the the pulse rate. So I started taking my temperature lately, and yeah, I I noticed it was kind of low. And I think the, all the list of symptoms you said with hypothyroid, that's a lot of people are facing those. You, you listed so many things that people are facing, and even the the like being cold. I've I've heard of people who are on you know low carb diets for too long, and they they don't sleep well, and they're always cold, and you know they're. It goes all the way into yeah, amenorrhea, losing their period, you know, just just hormone problems, all all kinds of things. So, I always am staying open minded and changing my views. And I luckily never went super low carb for a super long time. Maybe it works for some people. Maybe it doesn't. I, maybe we could talk about that. Like, if you think it does work for some people, but I have always tried to say, let's not do this forever. Like, there's different interventions that can be good. Like you even mentioned the autoimmune paleo. I mean, maybe that could be really good to reset your gut and stuff, but let's not do that forever. So, so I did notice that I was, I had like cold hands and feet and maybe my sleep wasn't great. And other people have, have told me about this too. Even Paul Saladino, right? This carnivore MD guy, he's, I mean, he's a friend of mine, but he's talking about, you know, going all animal based and was all into it. And then he loosened up. He's like, Oh wait, maybe we should have some honey and some fruit. And so I think he kind of talked about it publicly that he wanted to change and and have optimum function and maybe he wasn't doing as well as he could have. So basically I'm saying there there's always room for improvement. We should be checking things like the temperature. I guess uh, maybe you could tell me more about why that really indicates thyroid function and uh, just why you want a high temperature. Sure. Not high, um, sorry. 37 degrees or 98.6, which is you know, the appropriate temperature. Yeah, I mean, there can be variability. I, I've been quite interested, actually, when I, when I did my master's degree, I kind of got, it was really hard for me to do because I didn't have a medical license, so getting data from people. So in the end, I kind of put a call out on social media for people to go and record body temperatures and get blood thyroid blood tests done and then do a symptoms questionnaire. And I managed to put together a study that was kind of looking at that, is that, you know, people will still have all these symptoms despite having normal thyroid bloods and they'll also have uh, differences in temperature now my my belief is that the temperature in the mouth and the armpit should be very close together and there are some theories that say that suggest peripherally you should see you may see two to three degrees now I, anecdotally with clients i often find that the head is the last place that you'll see a temperature loss so orally whether it's in the ear or the armpit um sorry, ear or the mouth, that should be around about 36 and a half degrees or about 97.8 degrees Fahrenheit on waking. Now, after a good feed, uh, that should actually go up to about 37 degrees. Um, typically, if you think about why your temperature might be lower post, no, it's, it's your fasting temperature. So classically overnight, most people wouldn't eat for 10, 12 hours Therefore, you're kind of depleting some of the glucose available, the glycogen available in the liver. The brain preferentially conserves uh, glucose because it always prefers to, to met metabolize glucose. So my, my assertion that this kind of armpit and, and head temperature should be within at least half a degree and ideally kind of matching each other is that when I found that there's a, a bigger disparity between the armpit and the mouth, it was usually associated with the kind of uh, hypo symptoms that you might see like lower heart rate bradycardia you know kind of but well below 70 beats per minute kind of 60s and 50 beats per minute um and you'll also see the digestive disturbances you'd often see uh the sleep related issues now insomnia for an example or whether it's kind of failing to get to sleep or you know waking up at one two three four whatever having a really hard time get to get to sleep that can have some some grounding in digestive inflammation and perhaps why you produce high levels of serotonin when your, your gut's inflamed, but also blood sugar regulation. I mean, people talk about the complexities of kind of circadian rhythms and circadian stresses. Ultimately, if you can't regulate your blood sugar efficiently, you can't sleep efficiently. Why? Because the brain uses as much glucose in, in, the, in the deep phases of sleep as it does in the waking state. 
and, and if you so if you can't sleep properly uh you, you, generally your temperature is going to be probably a bit lower in your in your hands and feet and i think the hands and feet are a good marker of what's going on peripherally is is probably what's wasted first it's kind of it's a bit like when you're stressed what are the first things to go well fertility and digestion uh, and sleep and so your kind of temperature conservation peripherally is kind of it's 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 sent to the working organs because that's what you need you need the brain you need the heart the lungs uh and this is why you tend to see these issues go and for me when you see this kind of big disparity between the armpit and and the, and the mouth uh if you see a low temperature in the mouth uh, or the ear as an example then you know that someone's ability to regulate energy in the central nervous system i.e., the brain is compromised so i i kind of look at those and then looking at that pulse uh, as an indicator as well, because you can see people that present with a normal, normal heart rate, or even a, a, a kind of like a, a, a tachycardia, kind of over ninety beats a minute, because they're so used to running off adrenaline. They're using fasting as a, a tool chronically. They're not eating breakfast. They're training. The body's geared up for trying to get to get energy from you know aggressively metabolizing fats and in a really bad way protein. And sometimes, as soon as you start giving people breakfast or kind of give them adequate food throughout the day you'll see that the heart rate actually comes down. And sometimes the body temperature comes down because they're not running off adrenaline, noradrenaline and cortisol. So there can be nuances to the temperature and pulse rate. But again, that's where kind of a, a good kind of a, you know, just picture of the person looking at the forms, looking at what their symptoms are, talking to them can back up, you know, the, these crude evaluations, which I think can be, can be uh, invaluable in getting a better clinical picture than the blood test sometimes. Don't get me wrong, blood tests can be useful. Yeah, they yeah. certainly have, the, have their use, and there are certainly other bloods that can be useful. But the, the reliance of the, the TSH, in example, is, is extremely problematic. Well, yeah, so this temperature stuff is interesting. Luckily, my yeah, my mouth and armpit temperature are very similar, the same. But <clears throat> and I And I have been raising my temperature by eating more carbs for dinner. So I've been talking about this for a while now where I would do, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, don't like to eat all the time. Uh, I, I don't consider it fasting, but I just don't eat breakfast. But yeah, again, we can talk about each individual thing you brought up because you brought up a lot of different things that people will be curious about uh, because they may have not hear, heard this side before, right? That's why I've been, I wanted to have you on and expose people to more of this information. I mean, I've heard about Ray Pete's work for years and years, and I've, you know, I've dabbled in it and gotten more into it lately. And it's just important, again, to look at all sides. That's why I, I call it the Sapien framework. I don't have a, a diet. It's like there's a framework, right? And we can look at all different people, and maybe some people, you know, can do better than others without it. Some people say, hey, I sleep great, right? Like, I, I don't have these problems. See, I, I don't have any of the problems otherwise, too. I don't have any digestive problems. I don't have any like anxiety problems, stress, like everything is great. It's just, I thought my temperature would be a little low and maybe my sleep could get a little better. Right. So then maybe, oh, maybe, yeah, I would wake up in the middle of the night, but then I just go back to sleep and, yeah, and it would be yeah. fine. And, but so I'd, I'd get like eight solid hours of sleep, nine hours of sleep feel amazing, but I would just wake up in the middle of the night. Yeah. And part of that was just, I had to pee really. I don't know if that has anything to do with it too. Yes, yes, for sure. I think waking up for a pee is not a normal physiological occurrence when you're sleeping and usually a sign that blood sugar regulation is probably switching over to more fatty acid metabolism because uh, glucose isn't being regulated efficiently. And that dump of kind of fluid is part of the perhaps the, the uh, maybe more glucagon, cortisol, adrenaline being used. But, you know, the, the fact that you can go back to sleep is really, really useful. And you talked about, you know, what works for each person. I have got no problem with somebody saying this works for me really, really well, and it's totally counter to what I'm recommending to people. But if they're coming to me with symptoms that obviously suggest that digestion, sleep, mood, uh, fertility, pain, uh, all of these things, energy regulation are off, then it's not working for them. But if somebody says, I do really well if I don't eat, um, you know, if I eat my last meal about five or six o'clock and then not to till till eight the next morning but if they're coming to me and saying i can't get to sleep or i can't sustain deep restorative sleep then that's obviously the issue uh, and you talked about you know getting adequate food in or going long periods of time i i think you know fasting and and and, and calorific restriction it can be really really useful for people that overeat so if you're someone that likes to eat a lot of food, but you have a hard time regulating it, then fasting might be absolutely fine for someone. But it, I think you always just have to come back to say, is it working for you? And if it works for someone, 
perfect. I can't argue with it. I'm not even going to criticize someone for doing what I think is not not uh, within my philosophy because I, I can't argue with it if it's working for them. That's a good point because I work with people or have friends that have certain eating issues. And I, I've talked about this before too. My, maybe my eating issue is I do like to eat a lot. I, I don't think I have a problem, but I do like to eat. Uh, and once I start eating, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not a guy that can eat like a small portion. And then I'm like, okay, I'm fine. I'm going to eat later. So uh, eating two meals a day is great for me and I get adequate calories. I'm not in calorie restriction at all. I'm getting, I'm just not hungry until lunch. Right. Sure. So, so, and then, but then, but I don't, I'm, I'm open to changing that. If I see something that could be better then maybe I could try eating, I just, I just haven't found the need to do that yet. And just adding in the the carbs at night have been a good thing where I'm I'm eating kind of low carb for, for lunch still, and I enjoy just running on fat during the day, but then I do want to have those carbs at night. And I did actually notice if, when I had some honey, I slept through the night. You know, I had some honey after dinner, slept through the night, didn't wake up to pee. And but it's been off and on. It's not like a hundred percent, but that's why I'm experimenting. Then, you know, have more of these whole food carbs and yeah, I work out at night and then I have carbs. Luckily. Yeah. Again, it's a framework. It's not, I'm not saying, uh, you know, anything is necessarily wrong with other ways of eating as long as they're not sort of the sad diet, you know, just a standard American diet. And, um, I think there's, there's room to, to play around with this. So I don't think anything you're going to talk about today goes against anything that people have heard me talk about. It's maybe the most, the controversial stuff that people will be surprised is just you thinking that maybe not eating like fasting would be bad. I still don't consider it fasting. If I'm not eating for 16 hours, to me, that's not really fasting. I, I don't do any like two day fast. Maybe that's good for other people, but I just don't do it. Uh, or, or the, the sugar part, uh, I don't want to jump around too much, but just this is something that I've talked about. Well, it's like the sugar, refined grains, and the oils. There's so many problems with our world, but these are kind of the the three biggest food problems with me. But I've I've never said that the sugar was uniquely toxic. It's it's the overconsumption because of all the processed foods people are eating. They're getting too much of all the other things, and maybe it's just better when people lower sugar, but you're talking about how the glucose is is necessary and would be sort of anti-stressful for people's body. So, man, I don't want to jump around a lot, but it, it sounds more like the the PUFAs, the polyunsaturated fats are are more of the problem, I think you would say, and that the sugar kind of gets swept up into that. Yeah, I, I think um I think if you look at kind of like the diabetic model of disease usually people kind of would go to the doctors and hey glucose is high insulin is high would do a glucose fasting test the metabolic flexibility is all over the shop because when when you get someone to fast who's kind of metabolically compromised you're going to see these issues you'll see an altered uh, hba1c which is the glycated protein as an example and people will say oh it's your it's the sugar you need to cut out the sugar but the sugar is never the problem and, and it's usually the ability to oxidize sugar that's the problem uh, and this is where people kind of get the, the idea that sugar is really, really bad. I would agree with you. People can eat too much sugar. And if you're eating buckets and buckets of refined sugar on its own without getting adequate protein, adequate fats, if you're not getting potassium from, say, you know, that you get from, say, fruits and, uh, and things like that, magnesium, manganese, and all of the other nutrients and cofactors, this can be a problem. Uh, but I do think that, that uh, as much as um, people can eat too much junk food, never underestimate the, 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 uh, the impact of what the environment is doing to someone's blood sugar regulation on a daily basis. And if you live in a polluted city, a lot of these pollutants lend themselves to degrading aerobic physiology. So that means the ability to metabolize uh, fats and carbohydrates efficiently through the oxidative pathway becomes compromised. And so it can be, uh, you know, one of the easiest things, not to say this as humans, but the, one of the easiest way to make a, a lab rat diabetic is to, ex it, you know, overfeed them fats. It, it's a lot harder to, to make them diabetic by eating uh, sugar. But the primary thing is, is, is the, uh, uh, the overload of, of calories and energy into the system. And that's how you make uh, rats diabetic. So I, I think um, 
what most people are dealing with is sure you can overeat can you eat too much fats yes you can eat too many fats as well but i think with when it comes to uh you know poofa as an example when you're eating uh oxidized fatty acids that um are prone to produce vast amounts of lipid peroxides that degrade things or, or lower lower things like um glutathione produce byproducts activate the, the, the genetic uh, pathways of the ppars which are kind of known to upregulate in when you're oxidizing fatty acids aggressively this will produce other byproducts mal malon aldehyde which you'll find in in, in certain um, when, when you sesame, and that's quite interesting as well because that's also also associated with a with a hypothyroid state and then you also get a dumping because there's loads of glucose available Okay, so then when you get uh, you know loads of glucose in the system, sometimes what tends to happen is something called an activation of the polyol pathway. So you get large amounts of glucose and, and that's converted that should be converted to, to fructose, uh, and you get various in, in inhibitions at that various uh, enzymes, which means that fructose kind of that should be being metabolized also gets excessively produced as well and doesn't get degraded. So this is when you start to see things like non-alcoholic fatty liver increase. You see that kind of hyperinsulinemia, high, hyperglucose state. Uh, and a big part of that for me is it can be if you're metabolizing fatty acids and your thyroid isn't working, so you get poor thyroid pancreatic signaling, um, you know, production of the glut transporters or glute transporters um, and uh, inability of the, the pancreas to, to produce enough insulin to deal with this. So you get a combination of high levels of oxidized fatty acids, you get pollutants, you get a degradation of the thyroid pathway, and then you start to see all these negative things associated with, with sugar that's part of the diabetic state. Now, could you be eating too much sugar? Yeah, that's a possibility, but it's usually the concept of high fats with with sugar as well that would lead this self to this kind of pre-diabetic state because you can't utilize glucose efficiently. But it doesn't always mean that glucose is the problem. If you're eating lots of junk food, you can expect to to see some of that that occur, especially if you're sedentary. To the extent that someone's exercising, you can deal with excess calories, as you know, uh, and kind of regulate that system. But to the extent that the, the, the system or the person isn't exercising and that the ability to utilize glucose is, is, is decreased because of low thyroid function, high pollution, high uh, metabolism, of fatty acids, you will see damage to the the, this oxidative pathway. And this is where you start to see gluconeogenesis being upregulated permanently. This is where you'll start to see uh, the inability to switch between, you know, oxidation of carbohydrates and oxidate. You're kind of permanently stuck in, then you kind of progress to beta oxidation of the fatty acids. Now, when this starts to occur, you know, in, in, when you're oxidizing carbohydrates, you get more carbon dioxide and it becomes a bit of a self fulfilling cycle. So, this ability to use kind of organized energy or pathways by using thyroid hormone is substantially lost and i i do think that sugar gets blamed uh excessively when it could be certainly easily oxidized fatty acids and a combination of of pollution and the, the degradation of thyroid hormone or thyroid hormone mm. and its ability to to mobilize you know the oxidative uh, pathways it's really interesting yeah this is like the ult trying to get to the ultimate root cause of things and that's what I'm always trying to do. And looking ancestrally, we wouldn't have tons and tons of these PUFAs, like the highly oxidated, easily oxidized polyunsaturated fatty acids. And we would have had glucose. We, we did have fruit. I mean, we wouldn't always have it. So, I mean, maybe I don't know what you think about that. I mean, there's different seasons and you know, we could store some tubers, but maybe we didn't always have access to these things depending on where we lived. But uh, it still it doesn't seem right to to blame it uh you know diabetes on glucose for example yeah and i, I kind of think as well from a, even from an ancestral kind of health perspective if you were running around um looking for food and of course you'd be chasing your wild boar or whatever it was but you, you would you be likely more scouring for heads of kind of well, broccoli well broccoli's only been around two thousand years mm -hmm. or would you be looking for kind of dates hanging from the trees strawberries berries these bright fruits that kind of nature kind of attracts us to with these bright colors that that have a substantial amount of you know glucose fructose sucrose whatever that the carbohydrate is uh, I mean, it would be kind of a, a natural attraction that would draw us to these that are sweet, tasty, 
high in energy. So there, obviously they weren't around in as abundance as we see in kind of, you know, typical kind of industrialized farming and monocultures that we see these days. But still, it would make quite a lot of sense to me to see these kind of low hanging fruits, excuse mm. the pun, that are, 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 were available for, for people to consume. Well, I mean, it, it wasn't always available. I mean, I no, just, no. It was in Africa and it was during the wet season and we were went hunting with the Hadza. I mean, there was no fruit. They All they ate was meat when we were with yeah. them. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are obviously uh, geographical and demographical considerations for sure. And like you say, seasonal kind of availability would have been extremely important. Um, and, you know, winter, generally fruits aren't really around much anyway, are they? So um, it's it would definitely have been a seasonal thing and probably make, make sense why we could tend to uh, consume or, you know, favor carbohydrates more during the, the, the summer. Yeah. Well, I, well, what you're talking about is being metabolically flexible. Absolutely. And what you're also talking about is our modern environment and even pollution that you study now. And so maybe, yeah, back in the day, we didn't have this pollution. We didn't have all these other stressors. And maybe you'd even say, I don't know if you agree with this at all, that we could go, yeah, half the year and we could do fine fat adapted and doing all that and you know, eating meat and fat if we didn't have the stuff and then we we had more carbs in the summer and we ate all that and it was great because we could switch fuels and we didn't have all the poofas and oxidized you know fats like that and all the pollution yeah yeah it's, it's, it's certainly a plausible concept i mean you know uh, you know it, it's really difficult to compare you know where we were and people always talk about you know like i said earlier i was you know one of the people kind of promoting a kind of low carb paleo diet and you know the, the things that st stick out for me now is one, we have really no idea how, how old generally these people live to. And two, the environment now is a very different place from it was back then. And, you know, you could use the analogy of, of being an accident, an emergency, you know, in a bad way after a car crash or something. And the first thing they're going to stick into you is glucose and sodium to, to regulate your blood sugar and your, your uh, blood volume, right? So there, there's, there's a reason why glucose is essential and easily used. Uh, and to the extent that, you know, living before, you're right, it would have been kind of a lot easier. There would have been less pollution. We kind of would have had slightly more stress. We'd probably be more concerned about being attacked or taken out by something. But, yeah, it's, I mean, the stress concept is still the same these days. But we have more, unfortunately, more kind of nefarious kind of pollutants kind of lurking at every corner if you live in, a, in, a, in any kind of urban environment and even rurally you know depending on what type of farm you're close to and what what they use from a pesticide perspective what the water table is like all of these things can accumulate yeah well okay let's talk about the pollution but just before that you, so you are you are thinking that the the biggest problems that we face are what is it the pollution side is it the poly the the high amounts of poofas is it uh what is it i'll, I'll let you Go. No, I mean, like you know, I think, diet, right? yeah, because we're not. Yeah, I mean, you agree that saturated fat is healthy. You eat liver and oysters too. I just want to make pe sure people know. So, are you a fan of liver and oysters? Yeah, I mean, I, not, and I kind of, uh, you know, usually well, all the time with all my clients, I, I recommend saturated fat in moderation. You know, um, and depending on the person and their goals. But I think you know. 20%, even up to 30% of saturated fat can be extremely helpful for someone. I think if they're kind of more concerned about weight, then sometimes restricting calories can 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 have an effect. And But I, I don't think going high in the polyunsaturated fats makes a lot of sense. I mean, sure, it can have what is perceived to be less relative risk. Uh, when you look at cardiac studies that say, hey, people, we use kind of these, these oils and they lowered cholesterol and they lowered cholesterol triglycerides yeah from a perception perspective that's going to lower risk but how that pans out over time with various regards to um you know when it comes to membrane health or kind of you know diabetes uh, remains to be seen and that, that's why i kind of have a negative uh, approach towards some of those but i think the combination of, of i think pollution it, it, you, you cannot underestimate the the lingering effects and you know transgenerational effects that we tend to be seeing of accumulated stress that's being passed on to offspring uh, and you know I'm, I'm more of a Lamarckian uh, believer in biology rather than neo-Darwinism that says that genes tend to drive all these problems I think we accumulate stress and we pass it on um, you know 
to our offspring. And we, this is where we start to see, you know, hang, hang on, we're starting to see more kind of autoimmune diabetes leading to destruction of the pancreas. Well, perhaps that was already there. I mean, that, that there are already prerequisites to thyroid hormones. And if we're looking at some of the rodent studies that are really interesting, that are saying that actually some of the pollutants are actually altering the, the thyroid hormone set point in utero. So during gestation, that the way that the hormones are being perceived as being adequate or inadequate are actually perhaps negating the blood tests. So when somebody, uh, you know, um, early childhood is being tested for all of these, uh, whether it's a diabetes marker or, or cancer or heart disease, uh, because of they're showing signs of disease, it becomes really hard to detect true thyroid dysfunction. And as I said, thyroid function permeates every single le aspect of complex physiology. And when that's kind of uh, decreased, you're going to start to see problems that are kind of a little bit foggy to see. So I think the accumulation of pollution is is one, you know, whether it's emotional stress can be another one. I think EMF, um, uh, I, th I think, <laughs> unfortunately, I think uh, a lot of the real conspiracy theorists who were saying that 5G caused coronavirus actually uh, did quite a lot of damage to and played right into the hands of the uh, the marketing companies of the big telecoms companies because you know 2G, 3G, 4G has shown some very uh, interesting effects to reproductive tissues, heating of tissues, non-ionizing radiation that can contribute to thyroid cancers and other uh, endocrine cancers. And I think when you combine that with airborne pollutants, uh, pollutants in our food, in our water, you know that are being absorbed through the skin, breathed in on a daily basis, whether it's mold within the house whether it's mold that's found on grains, you know, uh, which produce something called xerolinone, which acts like an estrogen receptor. When you start messing around with the estrogen receptors and you lose thyroid function, you know, you're pushed towards a kind of pro-cancerous state. And so I, I think it's a, it's a combination of all of these things, you know, overconsumption of fatty acids that uh, oxidize very, very quickly. You know, bear in mind, some of these fast food places, they don't change their oil for a good week or so. So they're permanently being oxidized and damaged and causing these, you know, these lipid peroxides and acrolians uh, and, and, and all the other things that can potentially damage physiology. So you, it, it's easy to understand why eating a high junk food diet exposed to pollution, exposed to various stresses, whether it's sleep stress, uh, electromagnetic frequencies or kind of magnetic uh, uh, fields that can disrupt physiology, that they all accumulate. So it would be, you know, I think, uh, as I said, the fatty acids, the uh, the, and the various aspects of pollution, plus inheriting those damaged traits that mean that they're expressed at a much earlier age. Yeah, the like epigenetic part of this. Absolutely, is, yeah, yeah, huge. Yeah. And so, with, with the pollution, you mentioned a little bit about the thyroid. Does does this affect the thyroid directly, or does this pollution affect all different parts of the, the body and system? Well, it can affect various different aspects. So from a thyroid perspective, it can affect the thyroid gland, the morphology of it, how the colloid, where, whether the thyroid hormone is produced, how the, 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 the sodium iodide pump is, is, or, or transporter is, is used to generate thyroid hormone, various aspects of how thyroid hormone is produced within the gland. So you'll get hyperplasia, you can get thyroid nodules. This can lead to the kind of... Uh, very common. Uh, I mean, thyroid cancer is the most common endocrine cancer. Um, it's uh, you know papillary and, and uh, mammary uh, thyroid cancer. Sorry, follicular thyroid cancer are, are, are some of the most common uh, that can cause problems. So you have the the actual damage to the gland itself. Then you have disruption to circulating thyroid hormones. You get disruption to say the the thyroid binding proteins and the, the transport. So typically they're carried around on three main proteins, which is transthyretin, uh, thyroid binding globulin, and albumin. Uh, and you, it's it's common that uh, high levels of fatty acids can push uh, T four off transthyretin. Uh, you can find that uh, PCBs, bisphenol A, can do the same job as well, uh, and various other pollutants that can actually hijack just like estrogen can have that effect and, and push T4 off uh, some of the, cap, the transport proteins. So it becomes a, a problem of the, of the thyroid gland itself, how it's produced, how it's carried, how T3 binds to what we call the, the, the ligand binding domain. So basically, a lot of thyroid actions, you have genomic and non-genomic effects. Uh, and, and basically, when T3 binds to its receptor, it can cause gene expression 
or even suppressed negative gene expression. So we find that some hormone, uh, some pollutants are actually binding to that receptor and have an antagonistic effect. And this is where perhaps not just the genomic and the, the non-genomic effects, like the, the, the metabolic effects that can happen relatively quickly, uh, but we, this is potentially where we can see feedback loops distorted. So where the hypothalamus and aspects of the brain are constantly on alert, just they are looking for like low blood sugar responses to trigger, you know, adequate glucose being uh, broken down from fats uh, uh, to, to restore glucose levels, as an example. It's looking for that from a thyroid perspective. So if the circulating values of, of T4 and T3 or free T4 and T3 uh, appear normal, why would the hypothalamus need to kick in? And this is where we can see things like systemic hypothyroidism, uh, but perhaps the pituitary is absolutely fine. Well, wow, that was a lot. Well, okay, I'll, we got to go back. Yeah, we got to go back through so many things. Hopefully, people will stick around to the end of this one, and we'll circle back to everything. Because I even want to circle back to heart rate and athletes, and that you know they have naturally lower heart rates. But anyway, what can people do about the pollutants? Maybe we'll start there because you, you talked about yeah all the details of of why they're bad. But people are like, okay, now what do I do? <laughs> Sure. Uh, well, I think there's a number of things that can be done. Uh, first of all, sometimes, you know, you, you've heard this well-known saying that you can't get sick in the same environment that made you sick. Um, you can't get better from the, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. That's, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's late, it's late here. Um, uh, well, I think you can, and I think some people have to. Some people have no choice, but there are things that you can do with your own home environment. And I think treating your home as a cocoon to regenerate. Um, I mean, I live in a city at the moment, one of the most polluted cities in in, in in the world and i'm looking forward to getting back to to kind of rural nature very shortly uh, but i think you know having that aspect of a treating your home like a cocoon you know good quality air filters good filtered water um uh trying to, i think organic food is is uh, is a must for some people a lot of people think that you know that uh, there are no benefits to it but i think literally the benefit of food eat, not eating foods that are sprayed with endocrine disrupting chemicals now Glyphosphates, carbamates, uh, Arcelor is another one. Have shown very, there's very robust data showing that they cause endocrine problems, uh, a vast amounts of endocrine disrupting issues, whether it's at reproductive tissue, whether it's at the thyroid, uh, and so I think you know taking into account your your home environment is a great start. Uh, and once you kind of get the basis right of food, getting good air when you're at home, your body can, uh, it's a, I use the analogy of Hans Selye's rats, or I think it was Hans Selye where, you know, rats that were allowed to swim around for hours, you know, would die at a certain stage. But if like and at 10 minutes before they were going to die, you held them out a stick, they actually were able to get back in and then swim for hours and hours more instead of dropping dead where most of them who hadn't been shown any help. And I think from a per perceptive um, point of view that your body can sense when there are kind of windows of opportunity that you can create more ro robust responses. So as I said, having your home as a place to regenerate can be useful. I think getting into nature uh, away from, uh, you know, industrial pollutants can be helpful so if you are living in cities as an example which is you know i think classically where a lot of people tend to get sick um and, you know going out to nature where you have cleaner air more connection with nature um can be very very helpful i also think you know adaptive substances this is where i think i think methyl in blue is a is a wonderful substance for restoring function including thyroid hormone uh, including restoring aerobic metabolism and, and that would lead into a kind of other adaptive stuff is that uh, there is a place, I think, for using thyroid hormone as restorative and increasing robustness uh, rather than breaking people down. And when you can understand what it does and how it can maintain complex physiology. And this is where, you know, other things like pregnenolone, progesterone, um, DHEA can be uh, pretty useful as well. Well, yeah, a lot. So, OK, let's take the the test, uh, the ts4 for example or thyroid would be would you say well people should figure out their problems first before just taking it and then there's also desiccated thyroid i know and so people are you know wanting a more natural solution do you think that is a good solution yeah i don't think it's ever a good idea to jump into just taking thyroid hormone and think it's going to create this wonderful kind of amazing <laughs> You know, life-changing effect. Um, I think nutrition is the foundation for creating change. 
Uh, and if you haven't got that right, you know, and whatever that means is right for you uh, can be dependent. You know, one of the reasons I talk about regular eating, if somebody's come come from a background of kind of doing lots of different diets that and they're a bit messed up, getting to the, getting them to eat every three hours or so is actually quite a useful stress reduction mechanism because the body doesn't have to keep guessing. It's not kind of dipping in and out of this kind of stress response of adrenaline, you know, of going into gluconeogenesis and 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 kind of producing more glucagon, you know, adrenaline or adrenaline and cortisol. So I think this is where food can be the, the well, foundation for getting the changes with thyroid hormones. Okay, we're gonna have to stop. And, and <laughs> there's so many different things we can break break down. So why why would it be bad to go make your body make glucose through gluconeogenesis? Well, I don't think it's bad. And I, I just think it's more of a kind of, it's a fallback mechanism. I think it kind of, we, we kind of end up going into the why people say, oh, you don't need carbs because you can make your own carbs from gluconeogenesis. Well, gluconeogenesis is, is kind of part of the problem in the diabetic state. And when I think when there's persistent gluconeogenesis, because you can't oxidize fatty acids all the time, sorry, glucose efficiently, this can cause problems. Now, if somebody who's got, you know, aspects of endocrine disruption, going in and out of that kind of breaking down fats as a fuel without glucose can be the reasons why they feel super anxious, can be the, the, the reasons why they get super irritable, reasons why they can't sleep, um, because there's they're not able to also produce adequate amounts of carbon dioxide that help the aerobic system to kind of function optimally. And that's why carbon dioxide can be also be beneficial as well before I digress into mm -hmm. that. Um, but I, I, this is, I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but I think too many people get caught up in the, you don't need carbs because you can make your own uh, carbohydrate from breaking down fats as a protein. And for some people, that's, that's a stressful place to be. What about, well, some people, they find this is the best place to be. Uh, I'm, I mean, I felt great being in ketosis and doing that stuff for a while, but I mean, I didn't do it forever, but what about people? I mean, I was just on the phone with a lady who, who has a son that had, you know, debilitating problems and being in ketosis, is the only thing that solved it, for example. Sure. And, 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 you know, I'll go back to the point that if, if you found something that works, I'm not going to argue with it, mm -hmm. uh, an individual kind of, uh, you know, responses, I, you know, I, I just can't argue with that. I've, I've just worked with too many people who've been through try, being in ketosis for long times or tried chronic fasting and people's hair is falling out. They're not, they're not able to get pregnant. They're not able to uh, regulate their hormones. They're producing low levels of testosterone and calorie restriction has just pushed them the wrong way. And I think, you know, this also kind of ties into where calorie restric restriction longevity doesn't add up from a uh, from a data standpoint in in, in humans um, unless someone's overeating then these would be really good this would be a great tool if someone's overeating again but bear in mind that some people you end up decreasing thyroid hormone and not just thyroid hormone you don't just uh, break down t3 you end up reducing the amount of thyroid hormone receptors that just don't often come back to where they were uh, post refeeds so it, it, it's a, it can be a knife edge for some. And if someone's metabolically flexible, or in some cases, there will be some cases that people who aren't metabolically flexible, like you suggest, where they've gone into, uh, into restriction or eating uh, uh, you know, a keto-type diet, well, they have responded. But for me personally, I, I, my, I, I see hundreds of clients a year that just don't do well on that. And it, optimizing glucose functionality is where I perceive the change that can come that can give them more glucose flexibility where they can eat more carbs or, you know, they can, uh, you know, get more out of their exercise program. They can enhance their sleep. And, you know, you talked about waking up for a pee as an example. When anybody's waking up for a pee at night, to me, that's they can't regulate their blood sugar levels. And that's why perhaps when you found honey that you would sleep through the night without waking up for a pee. And so I, I think it always comes back to, yeah, what works for the person? Is it sustainable? is long-term use of that strategy. I, I, I've, I've talked about it before. It's called, I call it the, the zone of dogma creation. Is that, you know, when everybody switches to a new diet, and they go, it's amazing, I've lost mm -hmm. weight, you know, I've kind of feeling better. You know, it's, for some people, that's running off adrenaline. That, that is being in gluconeogenesis and running off adrenaline and fasting. And it's, it, it's almost analogous to kind of, you know, runner's high, where you're having to produce those, those hormones and endorphins to kind of get you through that stressful time. 
Um, so that can be physiologically and that can be that, you know, demanding. It can be done uh, for, from, from, from a dietary perspective. And like I said, if it's working for someone and they're coping fine with it, good energy, good digestion, good mood, good hormone responses, whether that's testosterone production or menstrual irregularities or, or optimal menstrual cycle with females, mood, uh, sleep, all of these things. If they're working, I'm not going to argue with it for sure. Yeah, no, no I, I agree. And the, the thing is, I work with a lot of people who are the opposite where they, they had problems with, well, it, it wasn't just carbs, but maybe they have food addiction or they, they have problems with eating too much. And so they've resolved all those problems by cutting out the carbs. But that doesn't mean that they can't, go, you know, figure that out or that carbs are the problem. So does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, we just see different people, I guess. I mean, not that I'm a doctor either, but I, I work with a doctor and, but, but I agree with you. I, I, I am a bit new to this concept that they could be this adrenaline or this cortisol that is a bit masking the problem where you feel good while doing it, but maybe the, it's the long term that's not good and that there is an optimal way to eat where maybe you don't have to use gluconeogenesis to get your glucose. You know what I mean? Like what, what is this? Is there like a balance? I hate this idea of like the balanced diet, but maybe there is some sort of balance where you can get some of the benefits of being fat adapted, but you also don't have to maybe go into this stressful state, as you say. Well, I, I think it's like, you know, everybody thinks that with kind of what you used the term, I think, pro-metabolic approach, which I think is is kind of a, it, it can be a useful term. But it's like, as I said, eating on a regular basis for somebody who can't regulate their blood sugar levels efficiently can actually lower the stress response. So you talked about aspects of like kind of, you know, perhaps craving carbs. And I see some people say they're carb intolerant. And that, that for me is a kind of a, a I, I find that term really <laughs> really problematic but a lot of people will keep craving sugars because they can't get enough sugar into the cell you know you, the hyperglycemia hyperinsulinemia they can't regulate glucose efficiently and this is where thyroid comes into play here is that generally when you see people optimize their thyroid hormones they don't start craving carbohydrates as efficiently you can go you know get some people who do eat uh, two meals a day and do absolutely fine. Why? Because they've got to the point where their blood sugar is regulated, their mood's optimized, their balance is fine, everything is working for them from a, you know, a, a system standpoint. And I have no problem with it, people eating two meals a day. If it works for them, it's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but And it shows that they have metabolic flexibility. It shows they can fluctuate with the glucose fatty acid cycle between utilizing carbs and fats efficiently. And, you know, how can anybody argue with that? Um, it's, it's the people that can't sleep, can't get pregnant, can't produce enough testosterone, have poor responses to training, digestive issues, constipation, IBS, all this kind of stuff. That's a good sign it's not working for someone. And that's where, that's where somebody needs to say, you know, okay, that's been working for me, but it's not working anymore. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why there's that window because it's taking a stressor out, but then the diet itself becomes another stressor because it's not meeting the needs. And that could be for a number of reasons for in each person. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That That's why we're, where we're talking today. And I, I agree with you on a lot of this stuff. It's what works in the beginning. It's the same thing as why we kind of make fun of vegans because in the beginning they feel great because they start eating whole foods and ditching junk food. And we can't just say that honeymoon period is forever. And I do have examples of people that went too far. I had the, the strong sisters on the Sapien podcast. People may know them from social media. They're just kind of younger girls, very fit. And they they were like hardcore into the nose to tail carnivore, eating all the organs and doing a really good job of it. But I think they were in this calorie restriction and they, they were doing physique competitions. They're really lean and fit. But then they I think they said that, you know, they lost their period. They had these hormone problems, they had this and that all the a lot of the stuff that you listed. But they also had many benefits, like they got rid of autoimmune problems. And, you know, so there was some benefit to it. But you need to be honest with yourself. And look, did I take it too far or is this not working for me, even though it worked for me for the first two years? And that's what I and I just know other people, they, they, they cured a lot of things and they feel amazing, but they have some of these leftover problems and there's just still room for improvement. And, and I think the ultimate goal is to be metabolically flexible. And if you get rid of the, the most pollutants you can in your life, you get rid of, you know, the, the highly oxidized oils 
and you yeah you 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 can start seeing what the real problem is and it maybe it's not what you thought and that yeah you, you can eat some carbs and maybe you won't have crazy blood sugar swings or maybe you won't crave them as much if your body's working fast sorry better this is a little bit like dr kate shanahan talks about it's like you you don't yes you, you your metabolism is not working correctly if you aren't eating the right foods or you have these disruptive chemicals in your body and then once you're there you can eat a variety of foods yeah and, and you know i think the, the this the kind of approach of that what, what some people might call the pro-metabolic approach or eating more carbs is people will do you kind of one of the worst things that you can ever do is just jump jump straight back into eating as much carbs as possible mm -hmm. and wondering why you start putting a tie around your waist or you perhaps you kind of still swing around you know it can take some time for, for that optimization to occur and sometimes you know i have clients you can be eating the best food at the best time ever and if your thyroid hormone still isn't being regulated it's still not going to have that uh, efficient effect you can take people so far uh, and, and don't get me wrong a large number of people you can change a lot of problems with getting food right but there are some people whether it's inheritable traits whether it's something that's uh, in the environment uh, that's not being dealt with or it's uh, something that suppressed thyroid hormone physiology uh, beyond you know what food can do that they will need some optimal support by by whether it's taking you know a synthetic t4 t3 or an ndt or just a t3 alone they're, they're, i've seen so many different things work for different people yeah yeah so let's use things when it's appropriate but yeah try to figure it out first and yeah change all the things you can and then then figure it out so i i use a cgm now i got a, a free one so I, I'm not into all the gadgets and stuff, but it's been really interesting to to see. And I, so I have like excellent glucose control. I don't have dips or I don't have peaks or valleys at all during the day. I'm doing great. And then I'll have my carbs at night and it goes up and it comes back down. Right. And, and this seems very optimal for me. And there's probably a version of this that can be optimal for everyone. It, it just is a bit different, like you said. But yeah what what do, what do you think about that i mean or even the opposite what if someone was eating carbs all the time and they're on this sort of blood sugar roller coaster i mean that doesn't yeah. be my deal well i think sometimes glucose measurement can be a complete waste of time for some people because i think it can be super variable i mean you know just with anything with metrics these days and data uh, arbitrary windows have been created just to create more patients to a degree but I, I'm kind of digressing slightly because you're talking about blood sugar roller coasters and people can can obviously experience those so I think when you're kind of looking at you need to correlate that with the kind of negative symptoms that people are experiencing as well and this is where sometimes it might even come down to just playing around with macronutrient ratios you know somebody might do better on kind of 40 or 50 percent carbs or 30 percent or, you know, you know, that's why you see in some kind of areas around the world, people do quite well on a 70% carbohydrate diet. Uh, so, you know, I think it's just, it swings and roundabouts so, and working out what's missing for it, for each person. But, you know, being able to use glucose efficiently is, is, is mediated by thyroid hormones. And sometimes it can, it can take a, uh, you know, you might see temperatures and pulse just not responding in the way that they should be going. Um, you might need to kind of play around with timing. You might need to play around, as I said, with, with my, uh, macronutrients. Sometimes there, there might even be a need for kind of more B vitamins to, to optimize your aerobic function. You know, th th there can be so many different things to think about. Yeah. Well, I just always think that it just can't be good to be be going on too much of a blood sugar roller coaster. That's why I'm just wondering if there's this optimal zone. And I don't know if I've hit it yet, but just maybe not eating just the carb frequency could be a problem. So I'm just wondering too, you know, if people are gaining weight on this and it, or, or just the long term. Like, sure. And I, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I mentioned the jumping in back in too quickly with high amounts of, of carbs, not being able to use them efficiently. You know, it can be people eating too many calories. You know, if somebody starts gaining a lot of weight around the midriff, it's usually a good sign that they're either eating too much they can't manage uh, blue glucose efficiently. They end up storing it um, as adipose tissue. But I think I think it's it's not good to be on the roller coaster, like you say. But there can be many reasons why they're on it, uh, and it could be the food. It could be something that that 
that needs more work. So yeah, I would agree it's not good to be on that, but there are many things that you can do to kind of optimize that and get them out of that. Mm. And and how much do you pin it on the the PUFAs? Right? And even just we can even talk about omega threes. This is might be a shock to some because omega threes seem like this cure all magic thing. And I've even had you know these researchers talk about omega threes and then they're great and we, you know even the contribution to DHA and our brain our the evolution of our brain and stuff. But then I, I had Dr. Kate Shannon do a presentation and she showed that the omega threes were the most unstable and the 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 least used for energy. It it was um, so maybe there are some downsides there. Yeah, I think so. I, I kind of give you my kind of uh, thoughts on omega threes, and like I said earlier, I think you know a lot of people use them for kind of cardiac risk uh, as a protective measure. You know, consuming more liquid fats is beneficial uh, because saturated fats are, uh, are are bad. But you know, and it comes back to whether someone's consuming too much. I think it's very easy to say that uh, omega threes are really useful, as I said, because they lower L LDL. Um, they lower triglycerides and they give this perception of cardiac risk that might not actually pan out over time as does preventing absolute risk. The other thing as well is a lot of people talk about the concept of omega-3s of membrane permeability. And I'll just add something else in before I go on to that, is that in a lot of the, um, neuro, well, not just neurological disease, but DHA accumulation in the heart in diabetics is well known. And in, in Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia as well, there are often very, very high levels of DHA found that contribute to the abnormalities associated with neurologi neurological decline. Now, my theory on Alzheimer's is that, that you tend to see lower levels of DHA is because DHA is one of the most easily metabolized fuels and can be taken uh, and used very, very quickly. So from a cell membrane perspective, it, it can be used as, as, as a fuel. Um, and, and in fact, you know, depletion of, of uh, the kind of unsaturated uh, uh, omega-3s and the kind of highly unsaturated fatty acids with a longer chain is something that occurs very rapidly. So I think in, in Alzheimer's, as an example, it could be just that because it termed brain diabetes, because the brain can't metabolize glucose efficiently, it will go for aggressive metabolization of fatty acids. And those long chain fatty acids would be the first to go. Now, this, this kind of what I'm leading into now is, is kind of a little bit contentious because it, it tends to question the, the concept of membrane permeability and um, uh, the concept of mega threes for membrane fluidity. Now, thyroid hormones, and there's, I actually posted about this today, is because there's quite a lot of research that shows that thyroid hormones can create this so-called permeability. But then it leads into another question of what you believe from a cell membrane hypothesis, which is that there's a lipid bilayer that creates the stability. Now, I don't know if you've heard of a guy called Gerald Pollock. No. So he, he wrote the book, he's written the book, The Fourth Phase of Water and Cells, Gels and the Engines of Life. And he draws upon Gilbert Ling's work. And Gilbert Ling was uh, a guy who came up with the concept of the association induction hypothesis, which basically said that membrane pumps don't exist. There's not enough ATP in the system to drive things like sodium pumps. And Gilbert Ling's, uh, so Gilbert Ling, and then there's another guy called A.S. Trotian who kind of supported that theory. And Gerald Pollock's work is saying that actually the, the, the way that the stability of the cell membrane is really protein structures um, and they tend to create the stability there and then you get something called phase transition so you get like organized water this is where the concept of red light is supposed to do remarkable things within the cell because it creates some uh, a level of organized water so there's a polarity of water that creates this kind of communication and allows solutes to go in and out of the cell so the concept that omega-3s, omega just because they're liquid rather than the kind of solid cholesterol, uh, which has a phase within the cell, are there just for membrane fluidity, seems to be problematic. Now, bear in mind that these, these polyunsaturated fats, particularly the omega-3s, are very unstable. And when they oxidize at the cell membrane and phospholipids can, can, can get damaged and oxidized, they flip-flop. Now, one of the interesting things about omega-3s is that they're used in cancer therapy because they degrade the, the cellular wall of cancers and create big pores in them. And they cr can create something called pyroptosis, which is an inflame mediated response to the damage that's created by omega 3s. So I know that there's a lot of research about this saying, hey, they're really good for 
co preventing cognitive uh, kind of cognitive decline and, and metabolic disease. But there's a, certainly a, a very convincing body of research that suggests you do not want these things flooding your cells. That's really interesting. Yeah, maybe you could kind of recap in the more uh, simple terms of of why of that. Yeah, that specifically with the DHA and the use, using in the brain. Yeah. So, so from, from a dementia perspective, as I said, one of the, the, the terms used around dementia is called brain diabetes, right? Because you can't mm -hmm. use glucose efficiently. And therefore, you can um, start to influence the, the fatty oxidation or the oxidation of fatty acids, sometimes beta oxidation. And DHA can be some of, one of the easiest uh, fatty acids that can be pulled to, to be metabolized. So this is why we might see contrasting features between Parkinson's. Uh, now, the difference between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, Parkinson's is associated to, to various aspects of damage in certain areas of the brain, like the substantia nigra uh, and other areas associated with movement. Uh, and, you know, you see things like tremors and also kind of dementia-like states as well. So what, what tends to happen is that DHA interacts with something called acin nuclein, which is a protein. And, and you get this kind of contrasting behavior between cholesterol and DHA that, that, that's called a lipid raft. And when you see this kind of um, negative interaction between them is that the fatty acids which oxidize can promote this aggregation of acin nuclein, which is almost analogous to what you see in dementia, where you see um, something called beta amyloid. Now, you know, beta amyloid is associated with, with dementia, but beta amyloid is also a kind of a microbial scavenger as well. And there's also a school of thought that, that when you see more damage, um, say whether it's from aluminium accumulation, fatty acid oxidation, you may see more uh, converting of the proteins of these beta amyloids. Um, that they're us usually fine as a scavenger, but when they become misfo misfolded, can cause more problems as well. So it's really about how DHA can interact with these kind of proteins and cause degradation of structures because you get this clumping or aggregation of these proteins, acin nucleum within Parkinson's, and perhaps with the beta amyloids within within dementia. So there, there are very conflicting studies on these. Um, there's, there's nothing that's um, set in stone yet. So my, my thoughts on this at the moment are really contrasting the two opposing schools of thought. And, and when you see it within Parkinson's, this accumulation and the accumulation of DHA in the diabetic heart, I think there's a problem because there's certainly too much around. Also mm. in the auto metabolism as well. Mm. Yeah, well, th this stuff with omega threes, it, I, it's. I feel like I've seen people kind of dance around it a little yeah. bit. That no, science is kind of coming out that maybe they aren't so good in the same way that poofas. Like people, you know, in my world at least, they're they're against the seed oils, and everyone's talking about how bad these poofas are and all this type of stuff. But then maybe these omega threes are, are are kind of part of that same problem. And I, you kind of mentioned that. Yeah, initially it looks better, or in certain cases it looks better because of yeah the lab tests that we do now show that oh they can they can drop trigs or they drop your you know LDL, but maybe that's not what we should be looking at, and there's a, a different kind of long term picture. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you can even see like there's, there've been some studies that show that DHA has caused the damage and it's been rescued sometimes by EPA, but certainly even the monounsaturated fats can have a more protective effect because they're not you know, aggressively producing these lipid peroxides. And one of the things I mentioned earlier, that's often why you see adequate vitamin E being added to omega-3s, right? Is because they prevent that, that, or they try to kind of degrade, or, or sorry, lower the amount of lipid peroxides that are being produced. And it's these peroxides that can cause damage to, to basically the, the, the mitochondria and the, uh, uh, the electron transport chain. So where we're producing energy at the end to produce, you know, ATP, um, water and carbon dioxide. And that's just, just one of the problems that you can see when there's an abundance around. I, I'm still I'm too sure. <laughs> I'm still not too sure of the, the exact amount that, that can cause a problem. Uh, some, some people have talked about, you know, more than one gram a day could be problematic. But I've often seen, you know, naturopaths and other people kind of prescribing seven or eight, you know, grams of, of fish oil a day. Um, I think that can be a bit of a problem, too, especially in the long term. You know, when yeah, well, okay. For one, is vitamin E. Yeah, I, I I do understand that that is protective 
against the, this type of problem with the pupas. Is that correct? Or even if I even heard of people, if they're, if, yeah, maybe they're going to eat at a restaurant, they'll take vitamin E just to help protect themselves. Yeah. Or, you know, you know, uh, vitamin E aspirin or something like that can be useful. Um, but to, to, yeah, it, it could, certainly can be useful, useful <laughs> strategy. Interesting. And, uh, well, okay. Well, let's try to circle back on some things. Um, what what about the the heart rate? Because I understand, yeah. We, we talk about pro metabolic. Like you you kind of want a high metabolism, right? That's like kind of the, all the ideas you're talking about. That means you're having good thyroid function, I guess, and that you maybe want a, a higher heart rate. But then people know that, especially endurance athletes, have a very low heart rate. So can there be a balance there? Or maybe athletes would have it's okay to have a little a bit of a lower heart rate. Yeah, I'm still again my my philosophy with clients is getting them into a window of seventy to eighty five beats a minute, uh, and some people think that's really really high. Now, if you've got someone who's been conditioning themselves and you know going through various aspects of you know we, we look at athletes as this kind of. Uh, kind of peak performance but we all know that to a degree a lot of athletes <laughs> suffer mm. health problems in their later life so i think to the extent that, that cardiac function is, is optimal you know you get a lack of fibrosis you kind of don't get too much ventricular hypertrophy that causes problems systemically within the cardiovascular system but bearing in mind that bradycardia is you know in, in hypothyroidism for example below 80 beats a minute has been described as uh, uh, hypothyroid in some cases i think if you're kind of waking up in the 50s and low 60s and you can't get into the 70s now this is again this becomes contentious depending on what what your kind of school of thought is now there are plenty of studies that show, that talk about mortality increases above 70 beats per minute with every 10 beats per minute and that's associated with increases in all cause mortality but I think you need to kind of look at it from the standpoint here of when you're looking at heart rate as an, an indicator in isolation, you're not looking at the individual. So you're not able to compare failing biology with optimal biology. So it would make sense that someone whose heart is failing, um, they're oxidizing fatty acids aggressively without being able to use carbohydrates. And we know that heart can generally metabolize fatty acids as, as a rule, but the inflexibility leads it to not be able to use carbohydrates at all. And hence you see the accumulation of, of some fatty acids. So if you're just looking at heart rate getting higher and higher, then above 90 was associated with very substantial increased mortality. Above 90 degrees is, is generally defined as tachycardia anyway. And you certainly see kind of hyperthyroid states that 90, 100 plus. So I think that window of 70, 85 beats a minute is useful primarily because it ties into something called uh, the uh, staircase effect. Uh, and this was kind of goes back over 120 years, the guy called Bowditch, and then kind of revised by a guy called Albert St. Georgie. And he talked about the, uh, the quality of a heart contraction being it, when it's kind of, it, when it has a, an, a, a beat soon afterwards. So the longer the heart rate is between each beats, so you have more potential to go wrong could be some kind of arrhythmia as an example. So the healthy heart rate in comparison is a, is, a, is a steady beat. And I think that's where that 70 to 85 beats a minute is a very, very useful window. And yes, you can see issues with um, people conditioning themselves. And it, it's to the extent of whether you see those negative symptoms creep in, uh, whether you see kind of, you know, blood pressure issues creeping in uh, and, you know, other issues with, with perhaps slowing of, of cardiac function and changes to some of the complexes that you might see on an ECG. So it, again, it, it, it depends on the person, whether you see those negative symptoms creeping in. But if you think about that, that the concept of this healthy heart rate, uh, some people don't even like getting their heart rate up that much. They, they sometimes think that their heart rate's beating too much but i've mm. seen many people with the the slow temperature sorry the lowered temperatures when you start getting the temperature up and the heart rate comes up as well you generally see function tend to to get pretty into that kind of sweet spot zone that we want to get people in for me in in the way that i work with clients anyway mm. what well, okay what i'm not a big like cardio like endurance person at all i like to just you know do brief intense workouts i do weights and sprint and all that and I, well, I'm just wondering, well, for one, there's there's kind of negative correlations between people who work out too much and health. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, one thing I kind of just uh, make a point of is like 
when people kind of exercise every single day, and I sometimes I use a teaser with clients is, how would you feel I asked you to stop exercise? And they go, I get irritable, I get cold, I can't sleep. Some people exercise on a daily basis. I'm not talking about going for a walk or stretching or doing a few light weights. I'm talking doing a proper workout for at least an hour. And sometimes people will falsely inflate their temperature just to get them feeling good. They feel better when they work out. When you warm the tissues up, you know, body mm. functions tend to improve. That's why if you look at it from a seasonal aspect, you produce less thyroid stimulating hormone in the summer. And sometimes people who are more prone to kind of mood issues and seasonal affective disorder, when you go into winter, when there's an absence of heat and light, your thyroid doesn't work that well. Now, one way to, to, to kind of offset, you know, low thyroid function is to creep, keep increasing your body. That's why you see a lot of people when they retire, sometimes they emigrate to hotter countries, right? Mm -hmm. Or hotter climates because their failing biology can't can't be supported in, in their own environment. And it's the same thing. People will exercise to increase their heart rate, to increase their body tissues. And when they stop doing that, it takes them to a quite a bad place. And that's that's when you can see that, that the problems of, of exercise masking kind of hormone dysfunction. Interesting. But yeah, but you also don't, that's, that's interesting. So you don't want to over exercise too. What was the, um, do they have more like calcified arteries or something? Uh, over exercises. Yeah. Well, that, it's interesting because the, there's a comparison between uh, kind of sedentary people and marathon runners uh, and people who kind of ran just leisurely. A marathon runners actually had more calcified arteries than sedentary people. Uh, and, and I think that's probably tying into energy production, adequate calcium intake. Um, also, you know, uh, you know, arteries tend to calcify uh, when there's dysregulation between calcium and, and you know, activation of parathyroid hormone. Uh, and also from an energy perspective as well, if you're not producing energy efficiently, this is this is perhaps one of the reasons. You know, I mean, hypothyroidism is one of the primary reasons why um, arteries become less flexible. Uh, and you get this calcification infiltration that you can see on a, a CAC or a coronary artery calcium score. So, yes, to answer your question, uh, you know, it, different types of exercise can have that effect. I haven't seen, I haven't looked at any papers in kind of different types of sports, but I, I know marathon runners do experience in that for sure. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm just not into that. I, I, sorry to people who are, but it, yeah, it, it just seems like another stressor to me. You know, it's just this over stress. So, uh, all right. I, I know it's getting late for you, but just a couple more things. Vitamin A. Uh, so you, we talk about calcium. So dairy, vitamin A, liver. What, what do you, I, I heard some people talking about how you could have too much uh, vitamin A toxicity. Maybe that could be due to some other problems though. Uh, I, I'm not saying people should just supplement with like, you know, just straight vitamin A, but if you're eating a natural food like liver, what do you think that's a problem? No, I mean, I, I've seen some of the people keep sending me, have you seen this article about, you know, why vitamin A is a poison? I think it's coming out of a couple of people in the US. I think if, if you, you look at my, my bias is that I think potentially there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of people out there that are kind of low thyroid. The ability to utilize vitamin A is thyroid dependent because it controls liver function. Now, to the extent that you don't have enough thyroid hormone being converted peripherally at the, at the liver, First of all, it's very easy then to get too much vitamin A. Now, classically, uh, a lot of people will accumulate vitamin A from the beta carotenoids, which are not as efficient as the uh, the preformed vitamin A that you find, or the retinoids that you find in, or retinol that you find in, in liver. So, you know, you can see people with these orangey fat pads on their hands and fingers and feet. When I used to do more kind of physical therapy and, and pain work, I could usually ask someone um, if they eat sweet potato, judging by um, their, the color of their feet. And they go, yeah, how do you know? Because mm -hmm. their feet would be bright orange mm -hmm. and they had no idea that eating sweet potato on a daily basis was contributing to the carotenoids accumulating in the skin because the liver can't deal with it. So my, my belief is that, you know, I know some people that have eaten frozen liver in a smoothie every day for the last 10 years are some of the fittest, healthiest people I know. And I think eating liver once or twice a week is actually very, very beneficial, least of all because it has you know, other nutrients in it like copper and, uh, and other nutrients. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think eating liver is, is very, very healthy. And certainly from a skin health perspective, um, if you ever get people who are suffering from cracked, dry feet and uh, they get in the sun on a regular basis, you can usually apply substantial amounts of, of vitamin A either in the, uh, 
you know, like from like a palmitic acid or something like that um and uh like a vitamin a topical solution i've applied up to seventy thousand units a day and seen you know dry cracked skin go to very soft uh, new skin again within the space of a week uh and so i i think it can have its uses either way but i, I do think um that the people that are suffering with thyroid issues can have issues with the vitamin A if, if they if they eat them on a regular basis, even you know from the from the carotenoid squashes, uh, you know even fruits and, and vegetables can cause mm. cause that issue. All right, last couple of quick ones. What about carrots though? Carrots have a lot of the beta carotene, but they also have should have a lot of benefits. Yeah, I mean it's it's like kind of you know you got to kind of pick your poison to a degree. It's probably a bad phrase but you know carrots i think raw grated carrot salad i've I've seen do some wonderful things in clients with cure 20 years of ibs because you can just you know lower levels of endotoxin just by kind of uh you know carrots i don't know don't know much about about the 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 justification for for use it was ray p that introduced me to the to to why carrots because they grow underground and they have lots of uh substances that can neutralize bacteria and that's why when you eat kind of like a grated carrot in a, in a salad with some coconut oil, it has some very, very good effects on, on lowering endotoxin and excess bacteria. So, you know, having a grated carrot a day can have, you know, I'd rather have that in and get someone to not eat squash on a daily basis because it's the, the, the you know, it's just trying to get the, the, the most benefit. You know, there's no always ideal solution sometimes. Yeah. What about cruciferous vegetables? Um, I, you know, I... I think if someone has thyroid problem, I generally get them to stop because, you know, I've seen so many people that think, and I've seen so many people that come to me with thyroid issues that are just eating way too much cruciferous undercooked vegetables, uh, and they are high in the iothiocyanates and, you know, cyanide-like compounds that have the ability to disrupt iodine metabolism in the thyroid, so are, in essence, anti-metabolic. Um, and, you know, even something like, a, a, a courgette or a zucchini be the high levels of cyanide in them unless they're cooked properly and to be honest in the normal healthy person having well cooked vegetables in your diet is actually i think it's quite beneficial um, but to the extent that you're eating lots of raw green vegetable on a daily basis and wondering why your kind of energy has gone your your digestion is shot um, you're cold and not functioning very well. It's a very easy thing just to pull those out, and you can get so many other nutrients from foods like you know fruit and uh, other other veg and you know underground veg. I, I like leeks and stuff like that within clients' diets, um, but sometimes I, I just back off the cruciferous vegetables because I think they can cause more problems. Not to say that having them in the diet isn't isn't beneficial on some level. Yeah, well, I kind of cut those out. Dairy, uh, uh, for me, dairy is a superfood. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think you know, you'll get a lot of people that say, "Oh, yeah, I, I don't tolerate dairy. I don't do this and that." It's usually someone's stressed digestive system that's driving the response to dairy. It's usually some of the things you get. So many dairy products that have gums, guar gums, locust bean gum, carrageenan, uh, microbial rennet. All of these things can contribute to digestive inflammation where people blame the dairy. But the the, the amount of calcium and other nutrients in it, I think, is 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 a win-win, just especially when you're kind of eating lots of meat and, and vegetables that, and grains that are high in phosphates for optimal calcium phosphate balance. So I, 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 dairy every day for me. Love it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm into some clean dairy. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and here's one, coffee. Yeah, I'm just like, I mean, I, I love coffee, but I, <laughs> I, I, I studied um, a, a neuroscience therapy course and the, the teacher who's a, 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 a a uh, doctor, a Mexican surgeon, he thinks it, I'm just always spouting coffee because he thinks mm-hmm. um, he thinks I just uh, cite studies that are paid by coffee producers. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, there's um, I think there's so much good research on caffeine as an anti uh, anti cancer agent, uh, anti diabetes uh, promotes. Uh, in fact, it's very protective against liver cancer. And again, one of its aspects of function is restoring. Uh, aerobic metabolism it, it's it's a it's kind of like a pot, potent antioxidant to a degree but slightly more than that almost like an a, adaptogenic compound uh, so i think caffeine in the right dose and the sweet spot is between two and four cups a day uh, and uh, certainly people who drink that tend to have uh, certainly less aspects of uh, neurological decline i found in, in lots of people well i love it i just got a good espresso machine and so well, let's kind of wrap this up here. So we're kind of talking about why is it good to have a fast metabolism? Maybe that's kind of a recap. We're talking, we want a good thyroid function. You're kind of talking, I don't know if you, you would call it fast in 
quotes, but just why is that good? Well, let's kind of just frame it at the kind of longevity. And again, the the the, the uh, aspects of longevity is confusing mm -hmm. because a lot of people say, "Oh, we're seeing higher TSH, we're seeing declining thyroid levels in in you know people who are older." There's actually a few studies coming out that showing that people with higher thyroid hormones, like supercentenarians, with higher thyroid hormone levels, are much more robust than their kind of low thyroid counterparts. So, not to say that thyroid's everything. But um, when it comes to, if you think about maintaining complexity, um, I, I'm kind of going to quote Ray Pete here because I think it's a wonderful quote. It's that without thyroid hormone, life becomes cold and clumsy. Hmm. Uh, and you can th see that as part of the aging mm. process. Mm -hmm. So I think keeping tissues warmed, uh, coherent, organized, able to metabolize glucose efficiently, able to maintain the, the, the complex neurological function, that is just an in for me. Uh, and it's it's kind of understanding where people's thyroids are failing. So when you're seeing people who are living longer with higher, what would be per perceived as slowing down of thyroid function, perhaps we're just seeing these people where they're at is their thyroid starting to decline. And the argument here is, and it kind of also ties into the fasting thing, is that maintaining, there are plenty of studies that show that actually maintaining, you know, energy and rodents given the feeding them ad libitum has kept them alive uh, longer than uh, animals that are fed in, in a restricted manner and again there are very contrasting studies on that so and i think it's it comes back to energy regulation if you can maintain ed energy regulation you can maintain complexity you can keep your aerobic metabolism you know bear in mind cancer is one of the failings of of, of, of cell function uh, and uh, the mutagenic pathway and when you contain when you maintain energy um, far from equilibrium as it were in those pathways that, that keeps energy flowing through a system that's where we see uh, you know I think longevity occur and th I think thyroid hormone is part of that and uh, and as you're saying it's not necessarily a fast metabolism it's, it's an optimal metabolism yeah and I think we don't even know what that optimal metabolism is because we see <laughs> so many yeah everyone's yeah. just so pathetic these days uh, i don't know if that's a little harsh but uh, maybe our ancestors would think we were pathetic where yeah we're withering away cold and clumsy that seems to describe a lot of old people and even middle-aged people and young people and the people yeah. that live long and live strong is what i want to do and yeah. you know these ancestors we look at are modern ancestors uh, like the the hadza or the maasai these people they're not they are robust they're yeah, probably. Ha I should have seen if I could t get their temperatures and all that type of stuff out there in Africa. But uh, assumably, they they have a fast metabolism still or, you know, optimal. They're doing well. They're living long. I love it. Awesome stuff. Uh, I guess. is, is So is Tomo your, your nickname? Yeah, well, my surname used to be Thomas, uh, but and then I was in the army, and everyone called me Tomo, so that's kind of stuck. My mum and my clients call me Keith, but I don't really care. I've been called far, <laughs> yeah, I've been called far worse, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, uh, I, you can find me as Tomo Littlewood um, generally. Okay, well, yeah, let's find you. Uh, you're on Instagram. What are you on? You have a website? Yeah, my website is balancedbodymind.com um and uh i'm on instagram as tomo littlewood uh i find it hard to stay on top of any other kind of i mean there's a facebook page but i don't update mm -hmm. it that much but it's mostly instagram and and uh yeah so uh yeah and i sometimes knock up a um uh blogs every now and then there's some kind of uh hormone teachings on my website for members and and coaching stuff so yeah thank you very much yeah well thanks for uh telling us all this stuff and i'll get some links for you and i guess take care yeah great to have you on, uh, have me on the show i really appreciate it good to talk thank you <laughs> okay all right everyone thanks for listening thanks for sharing with a friend make sure to start back at episode one Go to nosetail.org for the delicious meats sent to you, the seasonings, the body care, the meat snacks, all of that. We have free shipping options for all of the products. Go to saping.org for the program. Lose weight, get healthy. We got your back. We got the tribe. A few lifetime memberships left. And we'll see you next week.